Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Meet the Press. I must begin by apologising for the absence of Mrs Charlton Heston, who had very kindly agreed to come here tonight, although she, had, she, had been, she knew she would have been travelling for nearly a week before she got here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, having got here, she was all ready to come, but she finally felt that uh, it was just too much and she couldn't face it, so she sends her apologies. I now have much pleasure in introducing the star of Ben-Hur, Mr Charlton Heston. Good evening, Mr. Heston. But the less pretty half of the Heston family, I promise. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I'd like to introduce the panel to you, Mr. Heston. First of all, Mr. Richard Hughes, one of our reporters. Good evening, Mr. Heston. Our film Good critic, evening. Mr. John Griffin Foley. Good evening, Mr. Heston. He doesn't and really look very fierce. <laughs> He's not, you know. <laughs> and Mr. Ross Campbell. Uh, Good evening, Campbell. Mr. Heston. Uh, everybody who has seen Ben Hur. Uh, and a lot of people who haven't seen it are talking about the great chariot race in the film. Uh, could you tell us something of how you trained for the race? Well, of course, the significant comment I have to make about the race, especially in view of the current preoccupation in America with uh, television quiz scandals. So on a television program, I feel it especially imperative to make clear that the race was fixed, and I knew it was fixed. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, the... Uh, even to win a fixed race, I had to go to great lengths to learn to stay in the chariot. And I went to Rome two months before shooting on the film began and uh, uh, worked every day. In movies, I've found you have to be able to learn to do almost anything in the world just well enough so they can take your picture while you're doing it. And that's just about as good as I got with the chariot. <laughs> And uh, did you have to shoot those scenes again and again with all the uh, Oh, yeah, the race accidents? was shot intermittently over a period of three months. And, of course, never more than a lap at a time in one shot. Yeah. And then that would only be for one small part of the lap. The horses might run a whole lap but uh, they'd only be shooting a small portion of it. And they had as many as three different units uh, of the, uh, the shooting company working on the race. Uh, William Wyler, the director, was shooting most of the significant footage with uh, me and Masala and so forth. But often we'd go off and work for a few days on another sequence and uh, a second unit, sometimes also a third unit, would stay behind shooting, oh, extras or guards or horses' hooves running or chariot wheels, things like that. And this process went on for fully three months. It was the slowest race ever run, I guess. <laughs> On the actual film, the race takes about 15 minutes, I think, or perhaps a little longer, does it, in the actual filming time? It seems like that. I took the trouble to check it one time on my stopwatch when I saw the film. And from flag to flag, it's almost exactly what it would be in a real race. Um, it's uh, nine minutes and 20 seconds. Isn't it? Mm. Now, of course, there's footage beforehand where the horses are parading yes, around yes. that doesn't count but the actual race is just over nine minutes yes. we were very struck by the amount of dirty work that goes on in this race uh, mr heston uh, particularly in the part of masala of course uh, thoroughly unsavory <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, you saw what happened to him <laughs> He certainly uh, uh, he got his desserts at the finish, but uh, in uh, Rome, didn't they have any stewards or any kind of rule, these, uh, these races? No, I did a little research on uh, chariot racing, which was certainly far and away the most popular sport in the ancient world. And we think of our big athletic stadia today as being something to look at. But the Circus Maximus in ancient Rome, which was primarily for chariot racing, held almost twice as much, twice as many people as any stadium anywhere in the world today. The Circus uh, Flavianus, also in Rome, held nearly as many again. And that's two stadiums 
of those proportions in one in one city. Yeah. The um, circus uh, in Ben Hur is meant to represent the great circus at Antioch, which was also very large. But uh, although it was very popular and lasted as a popular sport for several centuries, as far as I can determine, uh, fouling was perfectly permissible, indeed considered part of the part of the game. This is probably one reason why drivers were so important. Uh, a good driver would win most of the time with any reasonably good team. The uh, Unlike uh, flat racing or steeplechasing, well, I guess less in steeplechasing, certainly in flat racing today, the primary thing is the speed of the horse. The fastest horse, other things being equal, yeah. will usually win. But with chariot racing, not so, because... Uh, the driver who was most skillfully able to either scare off his opponents or bluff them out of a turn or wreck them would win. And obviously, the, the longer a driver survived, the more cleverly he learned to do these things. In this filming, were there any uh, real casualties among drivers or among horses? No, and many people find that hard to believe. I can only assure you with all the sincerity at my command that it's perfectly true. We were prepared for injuries or even fatalities to horses and even men. Mm. When I say prepared, I mean we were apprehensively expecting it. Mm. But the worst injury to a horse was a broken shoulder. And the worst injury, we had a couple of broken collarbones, some of the drivers, and a broken ankle, yes. which was not only the result of great good luck, but another tribute to the immense uh, skill in planning and handling the whole race uh, w by Yakima Kanat, who was responsible for it. Mm. And did you and Masala have stand-ins for portions of this race, or did you actually do all the driving? No, I didn't do all the driving. I didn't do the, uh, the fall, oh, yes. where Ben-Hur is thrown from the chariot, mm -hmm. and... Uh, I hope I need not say Stephen Boyd did not get dragged. <laughs> Another man was paid a lot of money for that, and he earned it. <laughs> you had to do a lot of training for this, uh, Mr. Heston. Do you think you'll ever be able to make practical use of uh, four horses and a chariot? No, I don't. It's uh, just another one of the number of rather esoteric skills I've picked up in movies. This first picture I made, I learned to deal blackjack one-handed, the way the, the dealers in Las Vegas do. I played a Las Vegas dealer in this film. And I can still deal cards one-handed, but my friends won't play with me if I do. So I, that's no good. My second picture, which was a picture about the circus, I learned to <coughs> load animal cages on a railroad flat car with a 10-ton uh, diesel caterpillar tractor. And this isn't the kind of uh, pastime you're likely to be called on for an idle weekend. I've learned uh, skin diving, charioteering, all sorts of odd bits. None of them well, you know, just to do them. <laughs> but I've long since given up trying to uh, fit them into my everyday pattern of living. You say, Mr. Heston, that um, the race was fixed, well, naturally enough. Uh, is it not a fact that in one of the stage versions, uh, uh, Masala once beat Ben Hur because the treadmill got stuck? <laughs> Mr. Foley, you display an encyclopedic knowledge of American theater history. You're perfectly right. <laughs> this was, uh, I wonder if you also know that uh, the actor playing Masala at that time was the man who created the role, and this was before his remarkable career in the early silent films. Um, was William S. Hart. Oh, William S. Hart, yes. yes. And one of the treadmills, this was in Boston, broke down and <laughs> Masala won the race. <laughs> <laughs> there must have been booze from the crowd. Yeah. Calls for the stewards. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Heston, um, how long have you been acting and how many films have you made so far? Well, I suppose I've been acting all my life. I haven't been making a living at it for very long, though. Uh, I've been in films exactly 10 years this ten. month and i think i have made 
17 in that time. Uh, uh, 10 years, uh, uh, that dates from your um, 16 millimeter version of Julius Caesar? No, I wasn't counting that. That okay. was made the year before. Mm -hmm. That was really not a professional film. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, had been acting on Broadway then, but had never acted professionally in films. Mm -hmm. And this was um, almost a wholly amateur undertaking. I came back from New York and played in it during a summer and was paid $35 a week because I said I couldn't afford to work free. I'd starve to death, <laughs> but uh, everyone else did. Uh -huh. Could you tell us some of those? F we know some of the ones, the, the big ones, like the Ten Commandments. Uh, big think country. Well, of course, some of the others I'd rather forget. <laughs> <laughs> The what? Big Country, uh, Ten Commandments, only one comedy, which I'm inordinately proud. I'd love to do another one, a picture called The Private War of Major Benson. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, a biographical film about Andrew Jackson called The President's Lady. Uh, another film in which Jackson appeared very briefly, but I was admire the man so much I played the part again, called The Buccaneer. Mm -hmm. That was a remake of the original version. Then a picture uh, called The Naked Jungle. Also Another a couple of westerns. Uh, yeah, The Big Country. Several other westerns. The Big Country was the best. That's right. Mm -hmm. In the, the Greatest Show on Earth, I think you played the, the manager, did you not? Know? Yes. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, the most... I, aside from the fact that it was the first really important film I made and an enormous break for me. I remember that picture because the most, the nicest thing I ever had said about my acting was said in connection with that picture. It doesn't sound good at first, but the more you think about it, the better I like it. Um, the picture was an enormous success and was made, I was not at all known at the time. And Mr. DeMille showed me a letter he got from some moviegoer who had been very impressed with it. And he wrote in to say in detail what he thought of everything. And he spoke at some length about Jimmy Stewart's performance as the clown and Betty Hutton and Cornell Wilde. And towards the end of the letter he said, and I also want to tell you that I think the the circus manager did almost as well as the real actors. <laughs> <laughs> and the more you think about this, the better it comes out. You know? So I've always remembered that. Well, tell yeah. me, Mr. Heston, which of those films did you most enjoy making? I am coming more and more to the opinion that the uh, that a good film is not something you enjoy making. It's something you, you enjoy looking at after it's finished. I did enjoy making the comedy. One or two other uh, pictures were fun to make, but Ben-Hur certainly wasn't fun to make. Uh, William Wyler is a man of delightful capacities in engaging, humble, amusing, intelligent, witty fellow. Marvelous host, marvelous traveling companion, but when he sits down in that chair, nobody has any fun. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the more demanding or exacting role, uh, Moses in Ten Commandments or Ben-Hur, Mr. Heston? I think uh, probably Ben-Hur. The uh, potential of, of Moses as a character of, is, of course, almost boundless uh, as a symbol to peoples of three religions, you can hardly measure the, uh, the impact of this man's character. But on the other hand, there were, as far as playing him in a film, there were many scenes in that picture in which I did not appear. And also, Mr. DeMille's approach to filmmaking was less in terms of the individual character than in terms of overall scenes. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, Willie won't quit on a shot. In the first place, his whole concept of movies is in terms of the individual character. And in the second place, uh, his whole concept of a working day is not quitting on the smallest little shot until he's absolutely convinced nobody involved in it can do anything they're doing any better, including him. I was rather disappointed that there wasn't, wasn't a, an orgy in the... Uh 
Ben uh, Mr. Heston, is, is that that used to be more of the mill speci speciality, was it? Uh, as big well, I think the the orgy had a somewhat smaller place in Roman life than uh, certain aspects of our popular culture would lead us to believe. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you and your wife uh, at one stage were co-directors of a little theatre. Is that right? Yes, that's. Can you tell us something about true. that? Well, uh, I've worked in, uh, in a little theater extensively, both as an actor when I was a kid, and then the first job we had after I got out of the Army in 1947 was uh, directing with Lydia this little theater in Asheville. That was the year we needed by security. And I, the main thing I found out was that I don't like directing. <laughs> when you say Lydia, your, your wife's uh, stage name is Lydia Clark, is yes, that right? Yes, uh -huh. Since the boy was born, she acts uh, only intermittently, just enough to keep the franchise open. <laughs> Have you ever acted together as a husband and wife team? Very, very rarely. Uh, as a matter of fact, the next uh, job we do, uh, I'm going to London from here. We go down to Melbourne, not from here, we go down to Melbourne tomorrow, but then come back the end of the week and go on by Qantas to uh, London, where I'll be doing uh, Julius Caesar mm -hmm. uh, for television, and Lydia will be playing Portia in that. And what part will you play in that? Brutus. Mm -hmm. I've played Antony once. I think an actor should only allow himself one turn at bat with Mark Antony. It's the most actor-proof part in Shakespeare, and once you've done it, you should let somebody else do it. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Well, are there any other big names in this? Um, in As this a matter of fact, yes. Yeah, we uh, have a, a cast that I'm very proud to be associated with. And when I said that about Mark Antony, I should have added that in this case we also, although Antony is an actor-proof part, we have a marvelous actor doing it. Trevor Howard, who is a marvelous actor in my opinion, Cassius. Lydia, as I said, will be Portia. Wendy Hiller will be Calpurnia. Orson Welles, who's directing it, will be Caesar, and Wendy Hiller will play uh, Calpurnia. Mm. Uh, or Robert Morley will be Casca. Casca. Mm. 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 Uh, Mr. Heston, uh, there's been uh, some criticism of the um, scenes of uh, cruelty and violence in, in Ben Hur. What is your opinion of the scenes? I mean, of their well, I can give you a, a better opinion than mine, at least a more disinterested one. Uh, we were very af much afraid that the Lord Censor in England would uh, require some cuts of some of that footage because the British censors are notoriously stiff about the use of uh, violence in films. Mm. But he passed it without a foot cut. And when I asked him about it at a cocktail party, I saw I was in London for the opening there. And he said, I expect to hear a great deal about that from producers of other pictures who will expect similar concessions, which they will not get. He said, but it seems to me that the theme of your film is the futility of violence, and that therefore the demonstration of violence has some purpose. And I couldn't put it more succinctly. Mm -hmm. I'm delighted to know he feels that way. You think it would frighten uh, or horrify children? Uh, yes, I would. I'm happy to go on record before what I assume is an enormous audience here uh, in saying that I do not feel uh, Ben-Hur <coughs> is a film for children. That dull thud you heard in the corner was the Metro Man quietly <laughs> fainting away. But uh, I know William Wyler, who has uh, several children, has not allowed his younger children to see the film, nor does he intend to. I uh, certainly, Fraser, my son, would will not see it for a long time. He, of course, he hasn't seen any of my pictures. Yes. But uh, it's uh, rather too realistically made, I think. And uh, it, I, I certainly, because of the scenes of violence, which, while not gratuitously injected for the purpose of just for its own st for their own sake are still very tough, toughly made scenes mm. and I think puts the film in a category that's just not for children. 
There's a good deal of blood spilt in this film. Uh, what do they use for blood? Well, be before this picture was finished, I was beginning to think they were using mine, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, they use a uh, uh, concoction of glycerin and uh, chemical coloring. Oh, yes. It, de it depends. Now, sometimes, if they're if you're supposed to bleed all over a shirt that they're, that they're going to want to use in another scene later in the picture and they have to wash it out, then they use a washable blood. I see. <laughs> and sometimes they have to use a blood that will coagulate effectively. <laughs> so they have different bloods for different purposes. <laughs> have you done any live television work, Mr. Heston? Um, all the television work I do is live. I don't uh, do film television. I don't think uh, I'm speaking, of course, of uh, acting, of drama. I don't think you can do good work uh, in film television. The pressures of time are too great. So I do television quite frequently, but never on film. Uh, do you consider that um, a harder medium than um, films or stage from the actor's point of view? It's a different medium. I think the actor's uh, foolish to brood about the things that are tough about a given medium, because each medium has things that are hard. Uh, live television, there's a great pressure of time, and you're only doing it. It's one turn at bat, and if something goes wrong, it's not like in a play where you take it out of town to Boston for two weeks, and. If you don't like what you're doing one week, you can change it. Yes. Or a movie where, at least during a given day, you can change it. But uh, in live television, once is all. But it's still a very exciting medium, and a medium in which you can, at least in my experience, do parts you don't get to do in the other media. The Let's see, the last uh, live TV part I played was production of Beauty and the Beast. Now, that's not the kind of thing you're going to get to do in a movie, and very unlikely would you get to do it on, uh, on the stage. A writer in Variety magazine recently claimed it was the best um, training ground. Television was the best training ground for playwrights and directors. Um, would you agree with that? Yes, I think uh, it's, when I say best, I think it's almost the only available one. It consumes product at an enormous rate. Of course, the dangerous part of that is that it also tends to consume talent. You, you tend to uh, fall in, if you work exclusively in the medium, as you would if you were a young actor or director or writer, and broke into it and found yourself in a position where you were working on a given program, you can suddenly feel as though you're emptying grain into an enormous feed trough that is constantly emptying. And it's uh, hard to develop beyond a certain point in that way. You learn a certain facility and slickness, but uh, it's, it's a hungry box, that little thing sitting in the <laughs> living room. Mr. Heston, what do you think of what is called method acting, as, uh, which is exemplified to us by uh, James Dean and Marlon Brando? Well, method acting with a capital M is the most widely misunderstood thing, an overrated thing, that's happened in the theater since uh, boys... Uh, stopped playing women's parts in the Elizabethan theater. Um, method acting the small m is something that every American and British actor that's been trained in the last 25 years has gone through and means in its simplest terms that you can make an audience believe you best if you believe yourself. But method with a capital M means, of course, the actor's studio, which is headed by an enormously able man named Lee Strasberg, Lee Strasberg, who has taught extensively, worked extensively in the American theater for many years. 
I worked in one of his classes after the war before he founded the studio. He's a, as I said, an extremely able man, and his school's a good school. But uh, it's attracted a great deal of publicity, and because of the publicity, has attracted a lot of dilettante kids, which any acting school does, really. A lot of kids go to an acting school because they think it's uh, glamorous or fun or because they'll meet girls there or something. But and um, the actor's studio is certainly no exce exception. As for its more uh, well-known graduates, most of them, the better known ones, were good actors before the studio was founded. That was certainly true of Marlon, Eli Wallach, Mm. Uh, Julie Harris, Maureen Stapleton. Why do you draw a distinction between the method with a capital M and the well, method with a small M? I, it was a, just a, a figure of speech. When they say the method now, and they use a capital M, they're talking about the whole thing with the actor's studio. Yes, well, Strasbourg, uh, uh, Strasbourg uh, derived it from Stanislavski. Yes, and the small M is Stanislavski's method. Uh, and we've talked about it for years. Every school of acting I've ever heard of uses Stanislavski's method, but they use it <coughs> with a small n. Can we move from acting to fashions? Uh, mm. You, you uh, wear what looks to be a very comfortable kind of clothing in the, um, uh, in the, especially in the early part of Ben Hur, where you're going around with a kind of a long tunic with uh, a belt around it. Does it ever occur to you it might be a very comfortable way of lounging around the house in the summertime in such a tunic? Well, I uh, spend a great deal of my working life in something besides trousers. So I find uh, most uh, ancient costumes very comfortable. Certainly the Roman tunics and togas yes. were among the most comfortable and practical pieces of uh, clothing ever designed. Yes. We should have asked your wife this if she'd been here, but uh, did the, all the jewellery in Ben Hur, which was so striking, uh, f create a fashion in America for that kind of jewellery, that old Roman medallions and things? Uh, the people who have manufactured costume jewellery based on the jewellery in Ben Hur devoutly hope that this is so. Yes. I am not in a position to say. Lydia could tell you better than I. No. Uh, <coughs> we were. Uh, I was rather impressed by your uh, performance as a galley slave, Mr. Heston. Uh, are you a rowing man? Uh. I am now. When I got back, <laughs> when we were finished with those scenes, I, th I thought, boy, I really want to get back to America, but I didn't figure I'd have to row all the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Heston, I'm terribly sorry. This uh, session has to end. We had, we had many more questions to ask you, and I'm sure oh. the viewers would like to have heard the answers, but well, unfortunately we do have to stop. It. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you, gentlemen, and all of you out there looking. Now it's good night from Meet the Press.